WhatsApp and troubleshoot Google Photos is great, and there's a couple of other alternatives. But of course, you get to a point where either your images are being converted to a really low quality, you run out of storage space, you gotta pay for some reason. There's a lot of positives and negatives to different online cloud photo and video platforms. But of course, in this video, I'll show you how to host your own image and video management platform image. This is basically, I would say, a competitor to Google Photos. It almost looks exactly the same. However, this is completely self-hosted. You still get your latest images synced from your phone across to wherever you're hosting image. This can be hosted on computers, on the cloud, virtual servers, and of course, if you want to keep this at home, you can host this on something like a NAS or even all the way down to something as simple as a Raspberry Pi. Obviously, you just need the storage space, and of course, preferably, if you're going to be hosting a bunch of images here, a lot of it, and of course, redundancy and backups. So without further ado, let's get straight into image. First of all, you may have noticed that there's a buy button here and a section down here that says buy. What is this? Well, image is technically paid software, but much like WinRAR, there's an unlimited free trial period. You can purchase this if you wish to support the product, but of course, the only thing that'll change is, well, you won't have a buy button anymore, and of course, you're actually supporting development. Besides that, it's completely open source and completely free, technically. There's a get started button here on image.app, which you'll find linked down below that has a ton of info, depending on what environment you're gonna be hosting this in. For the most part, the easiest way to host this is using Docker. Now, I'm pretty sure I've covered installing a Docker before. It's actually really simple. And depending on what system you're on, it's one Google away, whether you're on Linux, Windows, or anything else. For me personally, I've set up Docker on my local Asus Tor NAS. This beauty was sent to me by Asus Tor, so this is technically a sponsored video. But of course, the drives are mine. And in fact, this box is mine. They just gave me the device and I can do with it as I see fit. On here, all that I did was I opened the App Store and I made sure that not only the Docker engine was installed, but also on top of this, I installed Portainer, which helps me easily manage different Docker Compose solutions, which is the easiest way to get this done. While there is technically an image version here, which I can just install and run, and it actually runs on Docker, I won't be doing it this way, just so I can show you the Docker Compose setup. So without further ado, setting up our image server. We'll need at least four gigs of RAM, two CPU cores, and Docker installed. You'll find this page linked down below. We'll make a storage where we'll host the Docker Compose file, and we can grab it from over here. There's also a .n file, which contains settings for it. As I'm gonna be using Portainer to set this up, I'll open up the Docker Compose page, or rather downloading it, and I'll download the env here as well. Once they're both downloaded, we have the image Docker Compose here and the environment variables here. What we'll do is we'll populate the environment with your own values. For example, I'll be changing ECC UDC to Africa, Johannesburg, as that's the closest time zone to me. Then the image version you can either leave as a release or you can choose a specific version like this one here. Then at the very bottom, we can set a Postgres database password, which you should change to a random password, capital and lowercase letters, as well as numbers without special characters or spaces. I'll generate one of these just before I save and close this file. Then the values here don't need to be changed. Now at the very top, you'll see upload location and database data location. Both of these are set to dot slash library. If you were just gonna simply docker compose up from whichever folder these two files are in, then it just uses these variables in the docker compose file here. So the upload location would be the same folder, just a subdirectory called library. As I'm hosting this on a NAS, I'll need to set this to a particular location. I've got a few different drives in here currently. I don't have a RAID array set up as these are just spare leftover drives. I've got four terabytes and one terabyte with a smaller SSD here for storing the operating system and things like that. For the most part, I've got a couple of different shares set up here, but I'll create a new share. So add new shared folder and I'll create a new one called image and we'll place it on, let's see, volume three is my four terabyte drive. So that's where I'll place it. There's also an SSD cache on it. So image will be stored on volume three. Next, I'll leave it as read and write for all users so I can connect to it from Windows, things like that. I'll leave it as this and there we go. Now that I've made this new share here inside of this access control window, I'll double click and make sure that we have access to it. So I'll give read and write access to all of the users here 
but of course we can get a lot more granular with this. Now that I've just created this new share, what we'll do is we'll set the upload location to that location in our file system. This location in my case is slash share followed by the shares name, so image, and there we go. So I'll leave it as library and I'll change this one to Postgres. Seems fine, we'll save this, and now we'll be able to Docker compose up and start the containers as long as we've renamed example.env to just .env or preferably copied and pasted this and they're both inside of a folder, much like this over here, Docker Compose and ENV. We can just Docker Compose up inside of this folder and image should start. But as I'm gonna be setting this up through Portainer, making life a bit easier, from my stacks on the side, I'll make a new stack. We'll call this the image stack. Web editor is fine. We can then copy and paste the Docker Compose in here. Scroll down, environment variables. We can load variables from ENV files. So I'll navigate to it and select it and open it. Then all of our variables should populate here. Now we just need to make a small edit to our Docker Compose stack here. And we need to change, scrolling down, the .env to stack.env, which is, as it says here, auto-created from what we set below. So the end file is stack.env, not just .env. And we can deploy the stack at the very bottom. I'll quickly change the Postgres database password now and then click that button. And now we just wait for it to start. The database has started and image is busy booting up here as well. Obviously, if you installed image through something like the Asus Tor app store here, everything that we've done this far would have been set up for you. But at least we got to do it manually. Next up, we'll access port 2283 on our device. Either use localhost 2283, or if you're connecting over the internet, the IP address or name of your device, colon 2283 should work. Getting started, let's set things up. Admin email, password, and of course, a name. Once you set these, you'll need to log in. And now we're setting it up. So first of all, doc theme, of course, language, English, privacy. Do we want to use a map and check versions? That's fine by me. User privacy, Google cost. If you wish to enable it, you can do so here. I don't think I'll be using this, so that's fine. Storage template. This will auto organize files based on user defined templates. For more info, see the documentation here. But of course, I won't be following this in this guide. We'll choose backups. And here it reminds us about a 3 to one backup strategy. As you might be replacing something like Google Photos with this, you're hosting it yourself. So you do need the best simple way to get a true backup strategy. Have three total copies of your data two of which are on different local devices. This includes the main files and a backup of those files locally. And finally, one offsite copy in the cloud or at another physical location. We'll choose done here. And of course, in the future, we can back up those two different shares that we have, once locally and once on the internet, probably on a cloud server. And there we have it. We're now running a fully fledged image server. I've got four total terabytes of space, 300 gigs is used, fantastic. Let's start by finding some images to throw on here. First thing that comes to mind is a bunch of my thumbnails for recent videos. I'll drag a bunch, drop, bam, there you go. Just like Google Photos, you upload everything. And of course, because it's all locally done, it happens instantly. Not bad. We can click things to expand it, view them, share them online, view info for the image, like it, delete it, download, add albums, archive, etc. On the map tab here, if you've uploaded any photos with EXIF data, such as GPS coordinates, they'll be located and digitally plotted here. And on the sharing tab here, we can create and share albums to share with other people. You've also got favorites, albums, utilities, archive for archived images, trash for deleted images for which they're permanently deleted after 30 days, and a locked folder here where you can set a pen code and store some images that you might not want falling into other hands. That's it. Now, the very cool thing about this is if we upload some images with faces, so let's just upload these, Markiplier, PewDiePie, and a software engineer. In the background, when you upload images, the image loading model over here should go through the images that you upload locally with a locally downloaded and hosted model running on whatever your system is. In this case, it's a lightweight CPU model. It'll start detecting faces and tagging them. So if we click on, say, this image here of Markiplier, you can see that there's a person detected. If we click this person, it takes us to all the photos of them. We can add a name, so Markiplier, done, bam, there we go. We can then check, for example, Explore over here, and we've got different people tagged, pretty much exactly the same as Google Photos. Click on someone, there's all their pictures, problem solved. 
on Google Photos, this pops up as people and pets, and the map tab over here pops up as places. If we upload a picture of Greenwich, for example, this does have exif data, like the camera it was taken on, exposure, etc. It's got a time and date. Obviously, these images are stored in whatever format you upload them in. They're not compressed in any way, except for maybe when you view it here, when they're on this smaller section here. When you view the actual image or want to download it, it downloads in the full original quality. There's nothing going on here, unlike something like Google Photos, where you can enable the compression to save on file space. And I'm pretty sure that might be a feature here that you can enable. Keeping your full quality images is probably what you're setting this thing up for in the first place anyways. Now, obviously, we only got to step three, which was setting it up and using it. But there's a lot more that we can do, such as setting up the mobile app, which you can get from the Google Play Store, Apple iStore, F-Droid, or from GitHub as an APK file. You can then punch in your address, so HTTP, your machine's IP address, 2283. Obviously, if you're going to be accessing this from your phone outside of your local router, you'll need to port forward it, 2283, and then punch in your home IP address here, 2283 slash API. You can then connect to it using your username and password, and you can set up automatic transfer of albums on your phone to be backed up, much like Google Photos. You can then see it on the Jobs tab and see progress of that. Then it gets to the database backup and restore process. Now, I'm pretty sure the image shouldn't have any disaster where you lose access to a lot of things, but that's why we have backups. I've heard of an instance or two in the past where people have had issues after updates, things like that. So having backups is super, super important. Image does have a built-in database backup system, for which you can check here. And the database only contains metadata and user info. You must set up manual backups of the images and videos stored in your upload location. Where to go from here? You can see the other ways we can install image, which which is install script for, I guess, running on bare metal, Kubernetes, Portainer. That probably would have been useful. Let's see what they changed here. Yep, they just changed to stack.env. So I did do the right thing. And instead of uploading, you just paste it in the environment variables right there. Not bad. There's also steps for Unraid, TrueNAS, Synology, post install scripts, steps for upgrading, and the config file here. Upgrading is simple enough. All you need to do is in your Docker Compose file, if we head to editor here and check the environment variables, expanding this, the image version is release, meaning that we can just click update the stack, repull images and redeploy, make sure that's ticked, click update, and the latest version of all of these different things should be downloaded and set up. If you manually set a version there, you'll need to check which one's newer and update to that. If you just used Docker Compose, you can Docker Compose pull to download new container versions and up. Now that we've got image set up, let's see how we can customize this further. Click your profile picture in the top right and we have two options account settings and administration account settings takes us here where we can set up app settings like language date format etc account we can change our password email address we can see what we've done on our account here we can set up api keys we can check authorized devices we can choose the archive size for downloads if you choose to download multiple images at once much like google drive if we select multiple images choose download it'll zip them up first and then download just one single file so here you go. This, I would assume, splits them into four gigabyte separate archives and whether or not videos are included. Features, we can manage how the app actually looks. So change album sorting, enable folders, time-based memories, people, star rating, share links, tags, cost, notifications for new albums, things like that. Password, we can change that here. Partner sharing to share our images with other people on our image server. Pin code for our account and purchase down here. If you wish to support image, you can punch in your product key here. Obviously, this isn't required though. If we instead head up to here and administration, we can manage users on the user tab here, create new users, email password, quota size. We can check out the jobs tab where we can see indexing, image processing, things like that, especially after lots of images were uploaded. Settings, we can customize auth settings like enabling OAuth. We can change when the database is dumped and backed up. Image settings, we can change the thumbnail settings for higher quality thumbnails. Preview settings here. And if we wish, we can compress the full-sized images. So that's where you enable it. If we tick this, we can choose, say, JPEG and a quality of 80. Obviously, though, I won't be compressing my images as that's why I'm moving away from Google Drive. 
We can manage concurrency on our server, enable external libraries, change the logging level if you're having issues, machine learning settings, we can change which machine is used for ML, so you can actually move your machine learning, contain it to a different server if you wish, change things like smart search, duplicate detection, and facial recognition, all the way down to which model you're using for those, map and GPS settings, we can enable the map here, and enable reverse geocoding, which is linked here, this takes exif data and puts images on the map. Yep, this is how it would appear. Metadata settings, we can choose to import faces from exif data, nightly tasks, such as clustering faces, cleaning up databases, etc., all of which are on by default at midnight. System notifications, we can set up emails. So we'll just need to punch it in SMTP server, port username, password, and our server can then send emails for notifications. And we can set up welcome templates here if you want people to sign up to your image server. Server settings down here, we can set an external domain if you wish to host it on an actual website with a domain. And then down here, we can disable public users. So name and emails are listed when adding users to shared albums. We can turn this off so only admins can see which other users are on our server. Storage template, change up the theme of the custom style sheet, change how long trash is kept, same for trash user accounts. We can enable or disable the version check here. And finally, video transcoding. Here we can check when videos will be transcoded, such as for example, when they're not in an accepted format, they'll be changed to H.264 with these audio codecs and these containers. Encoding options, we can change how it's actually encoded here target resolution, etc. Hardware acceleration, if available, we can enable it here. If we have an NVIDIA graphics card, QuickSync supported iGPU, VA API or RKMPP, not too sure what these are, but I'm pretty sure this Asus Tor NAS has Intel QuickSync, so we could enable that here. Then hardware decoding, we can also enable this if we wish. And finally advanced, we've got some options here related to video encoding. Now, if we save this hardware acceleration, I'm pretty sure won't actually be enabled just yet as we've just turned on QuickSync here. As we've got this inside of Docker, edit, you'll see over here, image server, extends, hardware Excel transcoding, service, CPU, GPU, and then quick sync, etc. But we've already done that inside of the actual apps settings itself, but we need to give this image container access to our device. So here I can add devices followed by the iGPU device here. Now I had to spend a bit of time finding it for this particular device, but this is the device that we need to give it for hardware acceleration. Down here by image machine learning, we can add the device here too. If for example, you're adding a CUDA graphics card that can be used for the machine learning operations like finding faces, things like that. But for me, just adding this here is fine. And we should be able to use QuickSync in the image server, for example. Update, bang, the server should quickly restart. And there we go, we're back. But yeah, that's it. You've now got your own fully functional Google Photos slash whatever else you're using competitor hosted on your own local hardware. So you've got full control over everything. Just of course, make sure you have everything backed up. That is super, super important. I won't be using this completely for my own stuff just yet. I'll still be forking over my new to Google for Google Photos drive, etc. for now at least, until I get a proper RAID array running here, just so I've got some local redundancy. And of course, I'll still be, I guess, paying for Microsoft OneDrive, Google Drive, etc. for cloud backups, though I'm doing that anyway. It's still nice to have full control over everything of mine in every way. But yeah, that's image. Let me know what you think down below. Hopefully you found this video useful. And again, a huge thank you to Asus Tor for sending me this NAS. It's been a lot of fun to play with, and I'm getting some real use out of it. My name has been Troubleshoot, and I'll see you all next time. Ciao.